Holy Gospel this day comes to us from Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. Then the Pharisees went and plotted to entrap Jesus in what he said. So they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are sincere and teach the way of God in accordance with truth and show deference to no one, for you do not regard people with partiality. Tell us then, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why are you putting me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin used for the tax. So they brought him a denarius. Then he said to them, Whose head is on this, and whose title? They answered, The emperor's. Then he said to them, Give therefore to the emperor the things that are the emperor's, and to God the thing that are, things that are God's. When they heard this, they were amazed, and they left him and went away. This is the gospel of the Lord. Grace, peace, and hope be yours from the God who so loves this world. Amen. When I was in fifth grade, I was on the end of my fifth grade year, I should say. We went to the middle school that I would soon be attending to go for orientation. And we all got in our various cars, and my parents got in our car, and we drove from where we were living at the time to this new middle school. And when we got there, the principal then, the then principal, Mrs. Midias, pulled out an old projector and decided to tell us all of the things that we would be doing in middle school. First of all, our scores that were no longer relevant in grades suddenly became very relevant. And she stressed to us that A, B, C, D, and F would be the grades. She then talked on and on and on about standardized tests. I hate standardized tests. And as she kept droning on and on and on, I got more and more afraid. She kept going on about all these things that we'd have to do. Suddenly we'd have to do keyboards, and at the time we didn't have a computer at home, and we'd have to do other things as well, such as, oh, gym class. I was not very athletic. And then we had to do other things too, like not having recess anymore and no times for snacks. And as she went on and on and on, I got more and more nervous. So that night when we went home, I resolved myself to a fifth grade education. <laughs> I had literally convinced myself that at fifth grade, that was it. I was not going to middle school. So then the summer came and I geared up to go to this middle school and it wasn't atypical for me on a regular basis to go around the house like this for weeks on end. Eventually my dad took me aside and says, listen, either you wear out the carpet and you pay for it or you tell me what's going on. I was so afraid. So I eventually confided in him that I didn't want to go to middle school. That there was something about that big building building with those giant lockers with combinations we had to memorize in hallways we didn't know and going from class to class in four minutes time and God knows those standardized tests and those scores I was so scared I was so afraid and so for the week before going up into middle school I kept getting more and more nervous every day that pit in my stomach hurt and twisted and I was in so much pain the night before it was time to go to middle school, as was custom, my parents took my sister and I and said, so how was your day? And I broke down to cry. I didn't want to go to middle school. So I said to them, I don't want to go. And my dad said, you kind of have to go. And I said, no, I don't have to go. What does an 11-year-old know? So we went back and forth and back and forth as I'm crying uncontrollably. And at this point, my mother has started to cry too. And she says, fine, I'll go with you. I will go with you to middle school. So every single day for that first week of middle school, my mom and I would walk to school together. And then when school let out, she would then walk me home from middle school. That first day, I was so, so afraid. I was trembling and shaking, and I was not the outgoing person that I am now. I was incredibly introverted, hiding behind my mom, hoping to not be seen by my teachers. And my mom gave me a big hug when we got to the doors and said, I love you. 
You've got this. I love you. You've got this. Friends, we join again in our Exodus passage for today. Moses has been traveling with the Israelites for quite some time, and even he now is starting to get restless. God saw the plight of the Israelites and the Hebrews in Egypt and went there and said, this is not a life that I have for my people. Slavery, bondage, and imprisonment is not a life for God's people. So God then uses Moses to bring about change and bring about reform, but Pharaoh, as we heard and so often know from history, didn't listen and didn't care. Eventually, giving up and saying, fine, go, leave. So the Israelites go from what they know and everything being familiar and the same, and even if it was awful, at least they knew that they had a place. And they go from there into the desert. The desert, the unfamiliar, the scary, the dark, the dry, the hot, the humid desert. And as they're going along too, people start getting agitated, as people often do. And as you heard last week, they create bulls, saying, this now is God. Moses has led us out by this invisible force that we cannot see, so we're going to make our own force that we can see. And as we know from last week, that God is very displeased with all of this ongoings. And so this time when Moses is going with God, Moses says to God, Will you come along with us? We're getting so close to what you've promised. Are you going to keep coming with us? And God says, I will go. And Moses says, that's not what I'm asking. I'm asking if not only will you go with us now, but if your presence will go with us into the future. God, my people are afraid. They are so scared. They don't know what's next. They've created bulls and you were displeased. And Moses said, I myself have done so much for you. Can you not just do this for me? Can you come with us not only to the promised land, but beyond the promised land? Can you come with us throughout our lives? Moses says to God, this will make you different than any other God on earth. This will set you apart from everyone else. So God thinks it over and God says, yes. I will go with you. I will go with you in life. I will become Emmanuel, God with us. Friends, that's the good news that we have in Jesus Christ. Not only did God go up to the promised land, but through the promised land, but then comes to us as a child and then as an adult and teaches us the way of love and accompaniment. And that's what Jesus' ministry was all about meeting people where they were at, but not leaving them there, sending them out into the world to bring them, bring them back into community. That's what we're called to do as the body of Christ, to go with everyone in their struggles and their pains, to accompany the Israelis and the Palestinians alike during this time as they search for answers, as they search for peace, to go with First Nations people as they look for land sovereignty and look for their own rights as well, to accompany people in their life struggles so that we might be the body of Christ for them. But the body of Christ isn't just sent out in times of pain. The body of Christ is sent out in times of joy and celebration as well, to commemorate anniversaries, to celebrate birthdays, to be renewed and refreshed in the waters of baptism so that we might continually be brought in by God who calls us all by name and sends us out into the world Yes, the body of Christ is broken, but it's also being poured out again and again and again. That's the beautiful thing, is that God goes with us so that we might go with the world. The other day, I called my mom. I told her the story about how I was so afraid of middle school, how I didn't want to go. And she said, Andy, that fearful fifth grader that fearful sixth grader who wanted nothing more than to run home to the safety now has a master's degree and lives across the country from his mom. And I started to cry, and she started to cry. And my dad said, what are you two talking about? (laughs) But that's the beautiful thing. 
That's what Christ gives us, that sense of community even beyond ourselves, that sense that there is safety and home with God. And that with God, we might encounter the entire world and transform it even more. Amen.